Armchair Critics Podcast. Armchair Critics Podcast. Members of the Notorious Armchair Critics Podcast have been arrested for having too many opinions. Armchair Critics Podcast! All right, welcome back, everybody, to episode 11 of Armchair Critics. I'm your host, Ethan Engert. And I'm your host, Aiden Howe. And it has been a while since a podcast episode has come out, and uh, I'll be honest, it's going to be a little while since another one after this. So we wanted to take a moment to talk about that a little bit. Um, Aiden and I are both currently in college. Most of you probably know that. Um, but we took this opportunity to start this podcast over the summer, and as school started back up, we figured it would be a good idea to focus more on our studies than this podcast. But we got a quick break over Christmas break and a really cool opportunity. We figured we'd do an episode now, take another short break, and get back into it over the summer. And uh, I'll let Aiden tell you about this cool opportunity. So you may notice that this is a significantly more uh, obscure and niche movie than we normally cover on the podcast. And the reason for that was a really exciting opportunity which was presented to us. About a month ago, uh, I received a comment on one of my letterbox reviews from a guy named Jack Clark. And he stated that he was a producer on this indie movie that he was working on, uh, which is the subject of today's episode called uh, Nobody Loves You and You Don't Deserve to Exist, which I, <laughs> I think for the sake of simplicity... I'm going to mainly refer to just no as nobody loves you for the sake of this episode. Um, anyways, Jack very kindly offered us a screener link to the movie so we could both watch it for free and uh, just suggest that we do an episode on it, give our, uh, give our thoughts on it, and uh, give it a little more exposure. So, Jack, if you're listening, thank you very much for the opportunity. We really appreciate it, and we're looking forward to diving into this movie. I know that I certainly am. Um, with this excitement comes a, a little bit of, of nervousness. I've never had a, a potential listener be maybe someone who worked on this film. Uh, so I apologize if we mess up any interpretations of this or if uh, we don't give your amazing film enough credit. But I will happily say that I find this film amazing. Aiden, however, what do you think of Nobody Loves You and You Don't Deserve to Exist? I thought this movie was awesome, honestly. Uh, hopping into it in the first act, I really wasn't sure where it was going or if I enjoyed it. It is a very slow-paced and unique movie in how it's set up, but as time went on and I got more and more into the flow and was able to adjust the feel of it more, I started to really, really like it. There's a lot going on with this movie. It's very thematic. You know, There's all these different influences that kind of combine in it. So you've got uh, elements of you know, Shakespearean theater and medieval morality tales and like uh, 19th century existential philosophy and modern political satire and kind of dark comedy, all these things mixing together. It's just, it's a crazy ride, you know? And it's fueled by uh, very powerful performances, I'd say, from a lot mm. of the cast. Not all of them are perfect, but especially uh, from such a low budget film, the performances were incredible. And they were kind of the meat of the movie in some places because it's just yeah. a series of monologues more than anything else. And I thought they were excellent. You know, I really like the soundtrack. I like the way this movie is shot. Again, this is a very small budget film, and it is pretty obvious that it's restrained by its budget at times. But I'd say that uh, the cast and crew, uh, Brett Gregory, the director, made good use of it. And uh, I'm really hoping that uh, if this, when this movie gets some more exposure – uh, Brett, Jack, and their crew will be allowed to uh, create something with a, a little more budget and a little more freedom because I just thought this movie was awesome. Yeah. Ethan, what did you think overall? Well, I have written down, Nobody Loves You and You Don't Deserve to Exist is an unconventional countercultural look at universal issues through the lens of one man. That one man, however, speaks for many, if not all of us, as he gripes with the culture he lives in, carry a very familiar ring to them. Uh, the accessible story is littered with rich imagery, unique ideas, and perfectly timed gut punches that drive the point home, wherever that home may be for you. Um, I found myself uh, at first a little disconnected as this, this film takes place in England, a place where I don't live. Um, however, as, as the film progressed, I really found much of many of the statements being made here incredibly familiar um 
you know, this this is a movie that really seems like it, it traverses space and time, you know, to put it dramatically. But, like, seriously, these are problems that um, are seen all around the world and uh, we have seen all throughout history um, s- sometimes uh, appearing in different ways and in different places and times. But um, I, I was doing a little bit more research and um, – uh, the 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 creator was claiming that he he got no funding for this because it was so countercultural, um, calling out many many issues that no public or private figures wanted to help him out. And I I do certainly believe this. This is very um, this is very honest. This is very transparent for uh, the 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 character involved who. Uh, clearly is is more than just a fictional character and um for for the culture mm-hmm. that it is speaking to um uh, and like i said it's, it's very accessible this is not you know some highbrow pretentious indie film though it, it is like i said it's it's unconventional but this is this is truly something that um i would call timeless i gotta agree um it's it's really really interesting how it sort of mixes these different roots of uh uh media that's generally considered sort of highbrow so there are a lot of references to like medieval literature and 19th century literature and stuff but that sort of plays second fiddle to uh the core of the movie this movie is made by working class people about working class people for working class people and it's kind of about you know it's like you said it's not snobby it doesn't come across as snobby or elitist. It's very, very honest. Uh, I was really, really surprised to see at the end credits, end credits that it was uh, dedicated to uh, two people who, in the film, feature as uh, characters who pass away and are sort of the impetus for kind of the breakdown of this main character. Um, yeah. This movie comes from legitimate sadness and rage, and it's really, really powerful to witness in a way yeah. very few movies... So, you know, there are a fair number of experimental movies that sort of address political issues, you know, but a lot of them just come across as uh, somebody goes, well, I want to make a political movie, political movie made. This movie is made by people who care about politics because it directly affects their lives and the lives of their loved ones. It's just fascinating to watch. Yeah, that's a that's a good point. Um, I, I noticed very immediately that there was kind of this. Um, more of an allusion to other media than than a focus on it, where it is not necessary for the experience, but it enhances it. And um, this is mm. something that I, I was reading that that Brett wanted to conduct in a way, like you said, this is this is for the middle class. He wanted to conduct this in a way that was um, uh, painting the middle class as intelligent you know um it is i i recognize the uh uh very prevalent piece of art in the film the um the garden of earthly desires pleasures i I don't remember exactly the title but i think it's the garden of earthly pleasures yeah yeah it's a it's a it's a victory to see this and oh i i understand uh what that means or you know the 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 books on a shelf or something like that you know it's it's really something that um, kind of sh- shows the people how smart they are as there are some figures in this film or some organizations in this film, like in real life, who do not value, you, you know, uh, um, who they would consider less intelligent people as intelligent at all. Um, mm. Those references to, to other pieces of media truly did enhance the experience. Um, they... I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about that that painting. I believe it's Bosch's again. I'll just refer to it that way. Is very famous, you know. Um, but it was, I think, the perfect piece to incorporate in this movie. Um, you see it in everybody has it. It's it's very central, and it's even uh, the opening credits are uh, inserts of that of that piece. And mm-hmm. this film is. I'm sure there's a t- many ways to break this down, but what really stuck out to me is that this film is just as absurdist as that painting, 
And that, I believe, is what the point of the painting was, um, initially done by Bosch. You know, that we, we live in, in this kind of world that is taken over by earthly desires, the desires of the flesh. Just what, you know, what happens when our sinful desires run rampant. And it paints this, you know, kind of, kind of dystopian look, it, the very, like I said, absurdist. And that's how the movie uh, plays out in these in these monologues where you know you're being talked to, but you, you, it's it's a fourth wall break. But this this character kind of knows that they are transcending time. You know they they speak of themselves in the past tense sometimes. Um, I'm of course talking about uh, uh, Jack's past selves, and. Um, in, in the direction as well, this mm -hmm. is a, a very absurdist world. Lots of, um, you know, unique, unique camera tricks. I don't know if I'd call them that, but uh, if, if, if you see the film, you'll know what I'm talking about. Um, but not in a way that came across as um, somebody who was trying to, oh, man, I, I just, like, really want to incorporate this piece, and I don't really know how. It's like he, he must have wanted to incorporate a piece, and he knew this was the right one. He must have known I want to do, you know, something that is that is more um, um, meaningful than just you know the most generic way I could shoot this, and um, it is it is meaningful. I have to agree. Uh, the sheer number of references to other works of media is almost impressive. Seriously. But again, I almost never found that they sort of overwhelmed it, or like it just felt like he was going. Ah, oh, you know, I think this painting by Bosch is cool. I'll just put it in for no reason. <laughs> it always felt crucial to the themes of the movie. Um, I'm going to geek out for a moment here. So one of my favorite books of all time is Notes from Underground by Fyodor Dostoevsky, which uh, is kind of this treatise on modern society, which uh, features a character. He's unnamed. He's mainly known as the Underground Man, who's just kind of a, a miserable, selfish human being. And... Uh, the entire novel is basically his soliloquy on the evils of modern society as expressed through his own shameful behavior. And he just, like, makes it very clear how evil he is and, like, how depraved he is. He's kind of speaking to this council of unknown figures. But uh, he blames it on society and with good reason. And this movie, at one point, Jack starts repeating the first line of Notes from Underground, which is very famous, mm -hmm. and uh, it's... I am a sick man. I am a spiteful man. I believe my liver is diseased. So this movie really taps into that kind of tradition of like, it's it's sort of Russian in a way. I feel like Americans in general don't do this as well as just your people. Writers from all over Europe are very good at sort of being deadpan and kind of mixing some kind of wry comedy into their sort of yeah. uh, existentialism. You know, this movie does have comedy at times in comedic touches by like working in things that you wouldn't necessarily expect like the first scene where jack wakes up and he sees this poster of a spider-man comic on his wall and uh green goblin says and today's the day you're going to die and it zooms in on that and it's like it's legitimately kind of funny because it's like oh this guy's staring at a spider-man comic and he's he's kind of having a breakdown but also it's it's quite sad and it's sort of like it feels realistic in a way you know, mm. when you get into enough of a funk, like anything can send you down even further. It's just very, very interesting how it worked those in. And I absolutely loved all the like existentialist touches and references and stuff that were worked into this. And I do think it all comes down to the painting. It is in, in terms of references, in terms of almost anything, really, I think it is the thematic capstone of the movie. If yeah. that's the lens through which we view the movie. It's hilarious, but also just horrifying, and it says way more about ourselves than we'd like to admit. Yeah, yeah, those are those are really good observations. Um, I think um, one thing that I v very highly value about this film is uh, the the theme it is exploring. Um, it, I'll say, I I love Fight Club. I don't know if this is like kind of an, an incel thing to say or a very you know generic thing to say, but I do genuinely believe that Fight Club is the most important film of all time. You know, that's I'm sure many people have said that, but 
Um, the thing that happened is, you know, many people have seen it and, and they love that and they want to replicate it. And what ends up happening is we get this kind of a um, kind of a pity party, I'd say sometimes, where people say, you know, oh my gosh, I'm marginalized by society. Do you feel marginalized by society? Oh my gosh, the elites are, they, they hate us and, you know, all of these money grubbing, blah, 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 you know, all of that. Um, this, this movie is certainly not that mm. and um there's this very interesting um i don't know may maybe equally as important uh um, narrative happening as as the uh you know fight club kind of countercultural attack on society um th there was this idea of a disconnect that it is it is more than just one person's fault and this is this is the the water I fear to tread, where I may have completely misread this. But um, wh what I'll begin with comparing it to is I recently listened to the album uh, Goblin by Tyler the Creator. Hmm. Uh, that's a very sheer change in trajectory, but the the album is is crazy, and um, all throughout. I'll just say Tyler is is talking about very similar ideas where he feels he's struggling with all this stuff. He feels marginalized, and he just expresses himself in in a very vulgar way. And throughout the album, you kind of cannot side with him. He's he says stuff that is unjustifiable. And at the end of the album, he he just calls everybody out and he says, "It's your fault. It's your fault. It's your fault. It's your fault." It's your fault. And uh, throughout the album, his his therapist, a person pretending to be his therapist, is listening to him and commenting on the things he's saying. And he says, Tyler, I've been I've been trying to help you. What do you mean nobody's been trying to help you? I've been trying to help you. What about your family? They've been doing these things. And that's mm. that's what I thought of when I was watching this film, where um, it seemed like there was this call to arms on both sides, on the the – the attackers and the, the, the defenders, you know, where it is absolutely the fault of, of people who take advantage of other people. However, it is, it is unacceptable to just accept that kind of stuff. Um, it is our duty to help others, but it is also our duty to help ourselves where, where we need it. It is not our duty to either say to put all the blame on ourselves or anybody else. But it seemed uh, like a, a very strong message to say, like, hey, this is both people's faults. We need to help each other, but we also need to help ourselves. Totally. For such a passionate political movie, it is not in the slightest black and white. No. It completely acknowledges that there is wrong on both sides of the issue. Um, Jack... Uh, Again, like you're saying, like Tyler, like the underground man, he spends a lot of the movie justifying himself uh, and sort of explaining, you know, what his upbringing was like, what's gone into his life that's made him into this just kind of lonely, angry, bitter old man. But at the same time, so he does not fully blame it on external sources. He hates himself. Yeah. And he's sort of taken to heart what his father told him, which, you know, is the title of the movie. Nobody loves you, and you don't deserve to exist. And by the end of the movie, he's sort of deciding, you know, they're right. I don't deserve to exist. I'm a terrible person. Um, so it's just kind of – and especially in the second monologue where he's uh, in in college or his college age, you know, this really came out, I thought, was the simultaneously massive disgust for his own behavior and the behavior of everyone around him where he just like, you know, he, he weeps, you know, he – he cries out, "There's no, there were no arts outstretched arms to gather me up, you know. There was nobody out there to love me, and if there had been, I might have turned out different." He's just sort of grieving for what could have been. It's very, very, very powerful, and it's something that he's clearly meditating on his entire life. Yeah, I'd like to talk about the performances. Real oh, quick. please! I thought this cast was terrific, like astonishing. You know. Seriously. Uh, a lot of the time with indie movies, you're looking at just terrible actors, you know, people who they just recruited out of nowhere. And, like, periodically when the stars align and you manage to get a reasonably good actor in a micro-budget movie, like, they're going to be uh, – you're not even going to notice because everyone around them is so bad. That is not the case in this movie. 
I think pretty much every major performance is at least good, and there are a few that stuck out as great. Yeah. It's a very performance-fueled movie because it's pretty much entirely uh, characters talking to the camera. That's the substance of the movie. So you've got all these actors, you know, they're amateurs, and they don't have anything to work off of. You can't work off of other actors who are in the room. But they did great. Jack's three monologues, which are with three different uh, actors, including uh, uh, a young boy. Oh, shoot. I'm trying to find his name. I'm on IMDb right now. Ruben Clark. Astonishing. You know, they were all great. Uh, I, in fact, I have not seen a child performance in a while that is nearly as good as Ruben Clark's. And I really hope he's going places. Absolutely. You know, Brett Gregory definitely had a lot to do with this. Uh, he, he there's, I guess there was some careful coaching involved, but, um, and, and there are flaws in the performances. You know, there aren't, some of them aren't perfect you know, you can, there are a few line deliveries where you can look at it and go, yeah, you know, this, this person doesn't fully believe what they're saying, right. but most of the time I was just blown away by it. It's incredible. I, I absolutely agree. Um, to such an extent that, you know, uh, before the film was even halfway over, I was saying, oh my goodness, the performances are one of my favorite parts, mm-hmm. which if you, if you told me I were ever to say that about any indie film, I would not believe you. You know, like that's that's you like you said that's just never a thing. Um, <laughs> but seriously, like like modern day um, modern day Jack, uh, 2020 Jack, watching him just, you know, steep in his life in his apartment is um, you know, just as miserable as it probably would be and just as he sells it so well. It's it's immersive just watching him. Um, I think of this one particular moment where he uh, looks at there are like two versions of himself occupying this room shown through a mirror Mm -hmm. and he's like looking at himself and he just like gets he gets distracted and he's uninterested and just starts like playing with his eyelash and he like looks at something he pulled off his eyelash very disinterestedly and i was like oh my gosh that was that was he sold that that was very fun to watch something that realistic and then going to college age jack um 1992 was that was very fun you know um there are plenty of performances in you know from from professional actors in hollywood movies who go for this kind of you know "Ah, i'm a a crazy guy look at me i'm a crazy guy and he's like all right whatever and he he rarely ever was that you know he had these moments where it was um I mean, I'm not a, an acting coach. I really know nothing. I'm an armchair critic, you could say. Uh, <laughs> but he, he, I, I saw him just like acting, uh, uh, not, not over the top all the time. There were moments where he needed to be over the top, and he delivered. And there were moments where he needed to silently seethe, and he delivered. And then, finally, young 1984 Jack, like you're saying, oh my gosh, that that child actor was so impressive, particularly because of the length of that take. Oh, man. I, I wish now I look back to see how long, but that was by far the longest take in the movie, and it just kept going and going. Easily four or five minutes of pure performance, and he just kept it going. Seriously. I mean, I'm certain that would be exhausting for any adult actor. That is not something I, as a director, would ever – not that I'm a director, but if I were a director, I would never ask that of you know uh, a, a child actor. And he absolutely de- delivered um, – so, yeah, performances were not something I was expecting to be this great, and they were one of the most enjoyable parts of the film. I do think there's a certain amount of theatricality to uh, most or all of them, but I also think that completely works for the tone the movie is going for. You know? Absolutely. It's, it comes back to kind of this great British tradition. So, again, I'm not an expert on, like, British literature, you know? I just have gotten a little bit into this world, and I just took a class on Shakespeare, so this is in my mind. It comes back to kind of this great British tradition of uh, theatrical monologue, you know? Mm. Shakespeare is a writer who focuses on this a lot, which is just, especially in a play like Hamlet, characters will just go on for ages talking about what's in their mind, expressing themselves to you, and it's all done through this very uh, colorful, vivid performance, which makes it interesting, you know, on stage. And this movie 
feels in many ways more like a novel or a stage play than it does a traditional movie. And the monologues were scenes that really reminded me of a stage play. You know, you've got this character, he's speaking directly to the audience, and he is is using this colorful performance in order to really express his emotions uh, in a more extreme way and drive home the point. Um, one thing I've been thinking about with Watchmen, which is a comic we both love. Yes, sir. Uh, bear, bear with me here. This is a bit of a tangent. Alan Moore uh, uses the comics form uh, for maximum impact because uh, rather than emphasizing the action and the excitement of each scene like most uh, superhero comics do, he uses the inherent expressiveness and maximalism of the comics form to uh, express emotions and so that every single just like sad statement or, you know, uh, sigh of despair from a character feels like a punch in the gut Mm. in Watchmen at a certain point. That is the case with this, except in more of a theatrical sense, where, you know, if you showed me clips of particularly college-age Jack's performance uh, out of context, I might look at it and go, this guy's overacting. That's kind of cheesy. But, again, it works perfectly for the tone of the movie because the character is just expressing such intense pathos that a subtle performance almost wouldn't work for it, you know? You feel like this character has just been... uh, you know, pent up. He's holding up all of his rage and all of his emotion. And now finally, just years of just suffering are pouring out in this one long disorganized monologue. That was what really stuck out to me about the performances is they balance that well. That's a, that's a very good way to put it. Yeah. Um, yeah. That makes me think of, of two things. One, we are uh, kind of, dancing around um this this what i've been calling this unconventional narrative um the structure of Mm. this story is uh that's that's one thing i'd like to talk about right now it is something that i really appreciate um this is something that i i really really resonated with me as it has in other i don't know if i could say similar movies i don't know if i've ever seen a movie similar to this um (laughs) but in a storytelling convention um, similar to this, uh, where I, I really liked the soliloquizing, you know, like like you're talking about. Um, not only because you got to enjoy these uh, performances, uh, but because you got to hear this uh, sometimes very flowery writing. Um, this film is also uh, peppered with these these moments of narration, which. I I don't know if this is an unpopular opinion or not. I love voiceovers in movies just because it is an opportunity that you don't see in really any medium outside of literature for somebody to speak in a way that normal human beings do not speak. Um, yeah. And it was, it was very fun to hear this flowery, uh, descriptive, uh, deep, rich language used to describe you know, this absurdist scene. I I liked this kind of timeline this movie uh, lays out without actually watching that timeline. You have one character describe years and years of their life leading up to 1984, and then another character describe years and years of their life from 1984 to 1992. And then you have another character say, you know, you you never see... um, uh, with, without getting into spoilers, just an unfortunate incident that happens to our protagonist. We never see it. We hear it described by um, somebody involved mm. in that incident, and just something like that. That was it was v- very uh, literary. Now that I think about it, yes, like you are saying, um, that we don't we don't get a play by play, which is usually uh, the the benefit of the medium of cinema. Um, but it was very interesting to see the strengths of the medium of literature, a, a separate medium from cinema, be infused with the strengths of the medium of um, cinema. It, it was enriching not just because it was unique, uh, but because it, it felt uh, – how, how would I put this? Maybe, maybe like there was more weight to it. It felt like there was more – more facets of one idea, more faces being able to be covered. Totally, totally. 
one strength of this movie, like a lot of the movies we've shown, is it sort of recognizes its limits, you know? It's a low-budget movie, and uh, it chooses, like like you're saying, it chooses to uh, tastefully omit some stuff as well as show some stuff, you know? Some of the incidents described uh, potentially had the potential to uh, become very, you know, meaty, dramatic scenes, but we don't really need them to, you know? Ah, yeah. Um, the movie is powerful enough without uh, going into all the rigmarole of, you know, showing characters yelling at each other and dramatic stuff happening. In a way, it increases the impact of these events because we don't actually see them. We just hear, sort of hear them described in, like, fearful, splintered uh, descriptions by characters who witnessed it, and they're just like, yeah, you know, this happened, and it, it kind of changed everything. Certainly, that's great. It's how real traumatic events are addressed, you know? Is like, you don't necessarily, and that that was a little bit of realism coming in, you don't necessarily, like, vividly relive something horrible that happened to you. You just kind of try to block it out of your mind, even though it's, like, changed everything for you. Yeah. It's a it's very, very powerful. And it comes back to a lot of these, like, great debut features throughout cinema. Uh, a very different film that comes to mind is Reservoir Dogs. I knew where you, you don't say see that. the heist. Yeah. <laughs> In this movie, you don't see anything except characters <laughs> describing things that happened to them. Wow. You know? And that just increases it because – and it increases that feeling of paranoia because you're just – almost entirely trapped in with this one character, Jack. You do see the perspectives of other characters, but you're trapped in Jack's perspective as he's just kind of sadly thinking over these uh, distant recollections of terrible things that have happened to him and to the people around him. Yeah. Your point about flowery descriptions uh, got me thinking. The soliloquies are not only... We've talked about the performances. They're incredibly well-written as well as well-acted. And, you know, it feels like characters... uh, it feels disorganized enough that it's sort of feasible as a, a real person just kind of spewing out thoughts. But there's occasionally this really, really cool descriptions that stick out. Like um, College Age Jack is talking about like clubs near his house. Um, and I think he describes uh, a club near him as tortured souls, bodies decomposing to electronica. Yes. <laughs> that was a line that stuck out to me. It's so incredibly vivid and it's just kind of, Having fun with the script writing, in a sense, it's uh, again makes those scenes way, way more entertaining to watch, and takes something that could potentially be a weakness of the movie, which is an incredibly long scene of a character talking, mm-hmm. and turns it into its absolute greatest strength. Mm-hmm. I think the three major monologues were the best part of this movie. Yeah. Um, again, that makes that makes me think of two more things. Um, uh, one of them being this will be set up for for, for the future uh, later in the episode, but this is going to be a spoiler free episode. Um, but at the end, if you stick around, go ahead, watch the movie, and then um, come listen to this this uh, spoiler filled ending where we can talk about all our stuff, all, all, everything that we wanted to. Like you said, this this movie shows nothing except for one thing. There is. Something going on with a suitcase. Mm-hmm. You see it in uh, uh, one of the very first shots of the movie. And it's immediately a question on the screen. That's the only thing happening. And so it, it grows in power, as you say. Come on, come on. There's, I'm going to see something, you know. And um, I'm very excited to talk about the, the suitcase later on and what we think that means. But um, the, the other thing I was thinking about is, is very similar. You were talking about um, some of those incredibly richly descriptive lines that, man, I love so much. And um, that, is, that is kind of what I was referencing when I was talking about perfectly timed gut punches. Um, this, this movie, oh my gosh, this is going to sound like super pretentious, but I, I love music. I've studied classical music. I am a drummer currently. I study modern music. And so I think of music often. So this this song or this movie made me think of a song specifically like a classical piece where in the structure of many uh, classical pieces of music is kind of that it just begins and then it goes. You know, it's it's not a movie. There are 
movements. It, it swells and falls back down, and you, you think of some pieces that kind of tell a story, um, but really it just it just goes. But there are always these staccatoed moments mm. where you know people say like, "Oh man, I love that one part," and whatever that song is, you know, th- th- those are staccato moments that you think about. Um, and there are there are many in this movie. Lots of them, those flowery flowery descriptions, and lots of them, uh, v- very good visual storytelling. Visual storytelling is something I value very highly, and. Um, this is this is a, a tiny minor spoiler. If you really care, you can skip ahead a couple seconds. But all I will say is that there is a moment, a scene opens with without the camera yet focusing on anything. It's an establishing shot, and your eye happens to notice that there is, uh, uh, let's say like a, a glass case holding an award that is shattered and taped with a red liquid around it and a man with a bandaged hand Mm. and that's that's a story and when i saw that that was one of my favorite points of the movie just like figuring that out um you know many critics will call this uh uh, valuing the intelligence of the audience and that's truly how it feels you know i felt intelligent discovering that um and understanding you know kind of the story that um was was being told by brett here the uh, the set design, I think, is very interesting in this movie. This movie doesn't have yeah. a lot in the way of sets. It basically has just, you know, a few locations, either outdoor scenes where a character just wanders through and talks or indoor scenes where uh, more uh, supporting characters are sort of seems like they're being interviewed, you know. But there are so many, uh, like you said, sort of miniature stories uh, throughout these scenes like uh the the interview with Jack's sister, you know. You can see uh like unpaid bills sort of littering her table and it never focuses on them. Yeah. They're very out of the way, but even that is just this tiny detail that uh contributes to the to the greater whole, yeah. you know. Love how that was pulled off. Um I'm I'm going to jump a little bit here. Got I'd like to talk about the technical aspects, particularly just the overall directing and look of the movie and the soundtrack. What did you think of them? Um, I was I was impressed with the soundtrack. I'm always um, I tend to be impressed by the soundtracks of low budget movies. Um, but this was <laughs> there were there was at least two tracks I was listening to, and I thought, oh, well, I I actually really like this. You know, I would yeah. I would download this if I could get my hands on it. Seriously, um, it absolutely is in service of the film. Um, I really like that about the soundtrack. And I would probably describe the direction in the exact same way. Um, I, I'm i going to go there. I'm sorry for any Notebook fans out there. I recently watched The Notebook, and um, I have I have no gripes with the genre of, of cheesy romance. I love To All the Boys I Loved Before. Um, probably not if I was watching them alone. But <laughs> The Notebook is just uh, unbearably, blandly directed. And uh, it goes to show that very popular, uh, high-budget movies can be blandly directed. And this film proves that there is no excuse for it. There are, like I was saying before, very interesting um, directorial technical choices um, that are not there just because they're cool, but they are there because they just make the movie better. What do you think? I love the way this movie is directed, you know? Um there were a few things that I thought were maybe a little cheesy, like the use of sped up footage um, in sort of transition scenes with the overhead, with a voiceover, you know, uh, hmm. in some scenes I thought it really, really worked, particularly like the ending shot. I'm not going to get into what it is, but I thought it was very effective in that shot. Um, a few of them, it felt a little like reality TV transitiony, you know, like, Here's okay. here's some sped up footage of uh, just you know the sky moving over a city. Like I've seen shots like that on the Discovery Channel, but also Breaking Bad. Yeah, also Breaking Bad. It's true. <laughs> they, and overall, I was extremely impressed by the cinematography. I thought the color grading was great, including in the outdoor scenes, which is really impressive if you think about it. 
Um, Absolutely, I did notice that. Yeah, yeah. The scene in particular, the first monologue with young Jack, where he's just walking through the moors, it's so beautiful, you know? This movie is just gorgeously shot, and it manages to find little moments of beauty in all of these ways. It calls attention to all these minute details with the camera. Um, periodically, it will have uh, a shot to just something that seems kind of innocuous, and occasionally it is, but I think it's just because it's so beautiful in a way. It finds these weird – it's kind of an angry movie. Yeah. I think angry in a good way, angry with purpose. But it finds these little moments of beauty. For example, um, Jack's English teacher, you know, is uh, like eating caramels during her interview. And the interview ends with this just little seemingly innocuous shot where she just like uh, pops a caramel in her mouth and then puts the wrapper down. And it's just this shot of the wrapper slowly sort of unfolding outwards like a flower, you know. And it's just gorgeous. Like this movie has – Brett Gregory has a director's eye. Overall, you know, th- this movie is directed creatively. As for the score, uh, I thought the score was really, really good, you know? It's got all these different elements I like. Uh, it's got sort of this, like, electronic ambient uh, tone that I like. But also, I, I really like medieval music. I like hurdy-gurdies <laughs> and stuff like that, which, <laughs> which it works in really well. I mean, the final, the credits tune is just pl- straight up played on a hurdy-gurdy. Yeah. You know? And it sounds awesome. I think it, in a few scenes, the soundtrack is maybe a little over, overly present. Again, I didn't, like, mind it. It never got to the point where I was like, this is bad music, you know? I liked all the music. But I maybe it didn't need to be playing almost all the time, which I think it was. Yeah. That said, you know, I really respect the choice, and I really want to see what else this composer does. Because I liked... I liked this work a lot. Yeah. Yeah. You brought up a, a very good point about um, Brad having a, a director's eye, and that specific scene of the, the Werther's rapper is exactly what I thought of in, uh, when before you even mentioned that. I remember watching that and thinking the exact same thing, where it's like um, uh, I've, I've always found that whenever I had to write – anything fiction for school or for fun or even just in you know uh, a, a short film I would I would like to do the thing that that I trip up on the most and I would presume is very difficult for many people is slowing down and um, shooting or writing things that are uh, un- unnecessary but just give you a moment to breathe you know I, I think it is it is very impressive to see a director choose to allow us to breathe without bam bam information 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 um Mm. and yeah seriously it gets to part of the pacing of the film but yes in that one moment and there are multiple um it was it was really interesting to just have these these beautiful moments that um are are present you cut away to an insert or just a shot of something else because it is there and it looks good and you know the viewer is going to like looking at that and that's it. And sometimes there is greater significance. Um, but I always find it a great triumph. Um, when you can show something that is unnecessary, when your focus is always what is necessary. Um, that also ties into, like I was saying, the pace of the movie, which – if you've not yet seen this and, and you're hearing us describe it, it probably sounds kind of exhausting or or maybe boring. Um, and it's not. Um, I think of probably probably a man who we both view with high regard, Neil Druckmann, who mm. is um, CEO of Naughty Dog Studios um, and the, the writer-director of The Last of Us. Uh, when he was talking about creating The Last of Us, he was talking about, and this really changed my mind um, about w- w- thinking of looking at the way that narratives are crafted, the structure of them. But he was talking about, because that is a video game, um, he was talking about having um, heavy narrative moments, light narrative moments, heavy gameplay moments, light gameplay moments, and how he would space them out in a way that that the the player would never get tired of constant action and never get bored of 
constant inaction. And that is very present here. You know, you have long five-minute shots in this movie, but they are placed far enough away from other long five-minute shots that you don't say, here's another five-minute long shot, you know? Um, while it is all very similar, mm -hmm. a, a very similar way to tell a story um, through these monologues, um, each monologue is different enough that every time a scene started, I was excited to see, oh, man, I missed the voiceover. And I say, oh, I missed uh, Jack's monologue, and I missed these interview-esque scenes. And um, they never overstayed their welcome. It was it, that was very impressive to me as you know that would be the largest pitfall in this type of movie you know um, I'm absolutely certain that many many Hollywood directors would struggle with sh with shooting this kind of film and um, you know rarely ever was I saying like okay I'm ready for the next scene totally got me thinking one of the great one of the elements it takes and I haven't really thought about this much, one of the elements it takes to create a great narrative is to a certain extent diversity, you know? You have to have diversity mm -hmm. of experience within the narrative. And I do love movies that, like, take place all in one location, for example. Rear Window is one of my all-time favorite movies by Alfred Hitchcock. That literally all takes place in one apartment. But mm -hmm. overall, in order to create a movie, a good movie, you know, it's got to switch up the experience constantly. And the more limited of a toolkit you have, the more impressive it is when you pull that off successfully. This movie is a great example yeah. of that. Brett Gregory has a limited toolkit to work with. There aren't even that many locations in this movie, you know? And I was watching it, and I was watching the first scene, and I'm like, yeah, this is good. I swear, you know, and especially when it started out with the whole pandemic angle, I was thinking, like, if this entire movie just takes place in this guy's apartment, I'm going to scream, yeah. you know? But it does not. It understands that. And even with the limited resources, it constantly swaps up the experience. You never quite know what to expect in the next scene, you know? It feels cohesive, but also just incredibly diverse in the overall experience of the movie. Different scenes have different tones, you know, depending on who you're talking to. Some of them are very calming and laid back to the point that I was sitting there, and, you know, I was watching this a little late at night. I was sitting, thinking, like, I'm straight up relaxed by this movie. <laughs> you know, a few of the interview scenes were very laid back. And then some of them are just punch in the gut. Like you said, five minutes of just insanity and just like it's an absolute ride. That was so, yeah. so cool to watch. Yeah. Yeah. One thing I would like to talk about is uh, each of those interviews themselves. One very unique piece of storytelling, visual storytelling and characterization was the coffee mugs. Mm, yeah, were, they all have different quotes. Yeah, and I thought that was like <laughs> it's it's hard to miss because I think I think actually every every scene ended with or at some point had an insert of what each coffee mug mug said. By far, I think that's correct. By far, my favorite was um, I don't care who dies in the movie as long as the dog lives. Um, I, I said, I, I know people like that, and they are my girlfriend. And, um, <laughs> you know, it's – but I understand who this person is now because of that, and that's yeah. that is super cool. Um, and uh, it took the unreliable narrator uh, bit – I don't know what you'd call it, shtick uh, – to, to an interesting angle because we, we, he, we have seen – the life of Jack and it is it, it's depressing and it is incredibly sympathetic we say oh my gosh I don't I don't want anybody to have to deal with this you know and I feel bad for him I wish it would end for him I wish he had a better life mm -hmm. you know simple as that and um, you, you sympathize with him you feel bad for him and you say it, it must not be his fault we see his his friends dead that can't be his fault you know um, but then we, we get this interview with his neighbor who's just bashing him like uh, relentlessly saying she is so mad at him and he admits that my my friends my two best friends are dead and she's like i i didn't really care 
And like, oh my gosh, lady, you know, this is terrible. And she ends up painting the man who we found incredibly sympathetic as, you know, this uh, obnoxious man to such an extent that initially I didn't, I didn't even realize they were the same person that we were talking about, the same guy. Um, mm. But it was, it was very cool to get a more well-rounded view of this story. Um, another one is a former employer of of Jack's telling a story that you say, I, I know what you're saying, and then I know what that really means, you know? And um, it was very cool to, to have this, you know, decoding and um, more of an active process. But also, like I was saying, you get uh, multiple angles of this picture, and it ends up being very uh, transparent, like I was saying before very honest um one one more thing I, I just could not wait to talk about was how honest this movie was and you know this is the story of a very angry man mm. who again i hope i'm not misinterpreting this seems to understand how poor of a reaction to life that can be at times and um you see you know just what what the little effects that blaring loud music can have on someone else but then you see the inverse how how big of an impact that person's impatient response can be and um you end up seeing like like i was saying you see lots of narratives about you know man it's always the higher ups uh burying us and and we're it's it's hard for us and it's it's true that is something that everybody deals with um but it is also the way that we interact with that and uh, that would be that would be something that I would consider more speculative, except for again one piece. I'm very excited to talk about in the spoiler filled section of the podcast. Yeah, yeah, it humanizes the. So you know, again, this is a political movie. There's sort of a political conflict at the core of it, and it's clear that there's sort of a couple, you know, two two kind of sides to the conflict. There's the people who are. Uh, sort of disproportionately affected by the choices the elites make. Um, yeah. Those sort of elites, and, you know, we can be upfront about it. This movie is at least partially about political responses in Britain to COVID and to COVID restrictions and stuff like that. Um, and it's sort of a criticism of the Conservative Party in Britain and their kind of downplaying of the pandemic and how some people died as a result of that, you know? This movie then humanizes that other side. Um, part of that is, you know, well, it, it doesn't directly connect her to the COVID issue. Uh, Jack's employer, like you're saying, who was interviewed, is clearly shown as uh, sort of uh, the other side, you know, how she like she kind of criticizes Jack for things that to a certain extent are outside of his control. She criticizes him for making the kids that are assigned uh, to teach that he that he is assigned to teach. She criticizes him for making them laugh, you know, and yes. she's like legitimately upset about it. And it's so horrible to watch. And uh, she complains about how he would like come into work wearing clothes that weren't like work appropriate, you know. And we got this thing earlier in the movie about how like one day he tried to wear fancy clothes to school and he was just kind of mocked mercilessly. So yeah. we understand why that's the case for him. And we understand that, you know, he just doesn't have access to his fancy clothes. Um but even this this woman who we're watching on screen is sort of humanized to a certain extent. You can see that she, like, has some issues of her own, you know, through cool visual storytelling and stuff. You can see that she's a human being of her own. She's just developed with one simple shot, basically, of the office she's sitting in, you know? You feel bad for her to a certain extent. And there's one other character. I really want to get into this in the spoiler section mainly. Uh, Jack's grandma who's uh developed in that way you know it's it's just astonishing how despite coming out of such a legitimately and i think justifiably angry spot i mean this movie is based around and i think inspired by the deaths of two real people who were close to the writer or writers you know but it takes the time to not just to not demonize but humanize the other side of that debate yeah i think that is an absolute strength of this movie like i was saying like that is so difficult to be so passionate about something which 
we so clearly see the case to be. I think I think one of the greatest triumphs is is Brett showing how hot headed and angry he is. Well, I should say angry he is about the situation without being hot headed. You know, it takes a very level headed person to be able to see and s- even sympathize with your aggressors, your oppressors. Mm-hmm. Um, I think, like you were saying, the, the the former employer was one one person who really stuck out to me as as a character who was built up to be hateable, you know, seriously. And um, I was just like, man, this this person almost seems like a one dimensional character until the end of the interview, where she she has this kind of goofy plaque on her desk that says top dog that she you know keeps lovingly uh, centering and, and moving around and after this super serious interview she kind of says to herself or to no one or to you like she points at it and she says my son made me that and it's it's it ends up being you know very heart-wrenching that mm. this is truly a movie that is is talking less about exactly what the problems are but the the reason i say this is so universal is that it it is claimed there are always going to be problems they're always going to be kind of this to some extent but what is the real problem the disconnect i was i was reading that that was something that was weighing heavily on brett gardner's mind that there's a disconnect between you know uh, people based on you know class based on uh, a location within a country you know things that seem so ridiculous to say out loud you know but we find ourselves all guilty of and Mm -hmm. we see these these people uh a a person is interviewed who has a completely different take on reality because they have an extremely religious take on reality and um that is no more or less valid than a less religious or or well i should not say that you know everybody would have their own opinion but you know it is it is no more or less valuable than um someone who is less or not religious and you know kind of like the the we we see in america i can say the, what I was very distinctly thinking of was the uh, very present di- divide in uh, the the political parties where we have kind of fans now, fans of the Republican Party and fans of the Democratic Party who, you know, butt heads like, like uh, you know, Bills and Patriots fans. And it, it seems ridiculous and childish. And uh, I, I find myself struggling with saying like, oh, man. Here's this alt-right guy I do not agree with at all that it seems difficult to carry on a conversation with. But it, w- what I have to do more than convince them I'm right and they're wrong is understand and, and love them. And that was a, a very compelling and mature message for this movie to have that is, is possibly the thing I love the most. Mm, absolutely. It's like it seems like it's kind of a universal thread within the pandemic that it's it's sort of this massive disaster that, you know, afflicted to some extent or another every nation in the world. Yeah. And it seems like it should have been something that sort of brought us together and unified us, mm. but it just kind of tore people further apart, you know? Right. That's the case in Britain, that's the case in the US. People just kind of stood their ground and listened to each other less. The pandemic had an isolating effect. You know, and especially on people like Jack, who have been isolated all of their lives long before this came along, it's just devastating. Yeah. And you can sort of see uh, attempts to make amends in this movie, attempts to reconnect with people that fail. You know, yeah. It's re- reconnection fails. Yeah. I personally am uh, ready to get into the spoiler discussion. I don't know if you have more you want to talk about. I was just about to bring that up. All right, so uh, folks, if you have not seen the movie, uh, please go watch it. Um, I think according to Jack's uh, email, it is available to rent on Amazon uh, and a few other places. Go watch it. It's a really excellent flick, and uh, 
you know, Jack and uh, the entire team. Uh, Brett Gregory could really use the support. This is a fantastic movie. So if you have not seen it, sign off now. We are about to dive into spoilers and really uh, dig into the meat at the end of the movie and discuss what it means. So, briefcase. What do you have to say, Aiden? Uh, so, it's interesting. There are a few different... Uh, it's, it's not directly addressed in dialogue that much. There are a few lines that sort of address it. So, for example, uh, College Age Jack has this moment in his monologue... Yeah. Where he talks about how he dreams that he's a serial killer and that he would chop up old ladies and put them in a suitcase, you know? Um, and then, obviously, the part where it really, really comes into play is old Jack's final monologue as he's dragging it up the hill. He's dragging it like it's this massive, weary weight, and he just has to keep, like, pausing and gasping for breath because it's so heavy. And then he gets to the top, and I, I think he pretty much directly says that his guilt is in it, and he gets to the top, and it's empty. You know, and he like kind of vanishes, leaving it open and just there's there's nothing in there. Um, I think, oh, geez, I think maybe it's talking about sort of irrational guilt in a way. You know, it's like Jack is being dragged way down. He's being completely dragged down by these things that are not his fault. You know, it's sort of the deal with like his dreams of being a serial killer. These are imagined sins. Mm. These are things that he feels like he did, but he didn't. And he's dragged down by those. He's been dragged by down those his entire life. It's that self-hatred that comes in. And I think the abuse of his stepfather comes into that a lot. You know, nobody loves you and you don't do yeah. deserve to exist. He believes that, especially by the end of the movie. And the weight of that self-hatred and that guilt is just dragging him down. But like when you look into it, it means nothing. You know, it's he doesn't yeah. need to hate himself yet. He does. Yeah, I think that is a a fantastic read. That's that's a little different than mine. And uh, now that I hear it, maybe maybe more valid. Hmm. Uh, but I think it all comes down to the fact that the briefcase is something that he was allowing to weigh himself down. And it was ultimately nothing. You know, it, it was something he was not being weighed down because there was truly some burden within, but it was because of uh, the way he was perceiving it, um, which was much of the grounds I had for, for, you know, talking about this being very uh, uh, transparent, him admitting to, to some faults in, in thinking. But I think that is a very, uh, stark that it is a very stark image in my mind of kind of like what do we do we see this problem in this world and you know when i watch fight club or american psycho or taxi driver or, or you know all these you know kind of literally me movies but you <laughs> know, uh, uh attacks on on culture where we see this is a problem now what you know what do i do and um that's kind of the question that's posed here yet again and it's it's saying like this is this is not the answer. It the answer is not allowing it to ruin your life. You yeah. have to do something. Do not be like Jack. Do not sit in your apartment and uh, drink away your misery until you are giving a nearly incomprehensible monologue. Um, do not climb up a hill with a a self made burden to to the point of exhaustion. Only to look at that burden and see practically a construct of your imagination. To a certain extent, the, I think that's very per pertinent. To a certain extent, the movie's self-reflective nature is Jack's own problem because the entire point is that he just keeps reliving the past and he won't stop. You know, mm -hmm. he's thinking back to all this time. He's like, "Oh, I'm just, I'm just thinking about that thing that happened to me in the '80s and this other thing that happened to me in the '90s," and he can't move on. You know. Yeah. And the movie has a tremendous amount of sympathy for him. And, you know, he's an incredibly sympathetic character in that regard because some truly horrible stuff has happened to this man. And it would be so incredibly difficult to just live on, for, you know, move on from it because life just keeps kicking him while he's down. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, he makes a conscious decision to not move on. And I think that's what it's ultimately saying about the movie yeah. is, you know, it's up to you to decide 
how much of this is the fault of the society around him and of the people around him who have just ruined him? And how much of it is his own fault for blaming the outside world and not changing? Yeah. And I have to say, from a less uh, academic, less ac- um, analytical perspective, that is just, you know, so impressive to, to see, you know, who, who do you probably sympathize with the most? yourself yeah and uh, to see someone uh, expose themselves to the world and and say you know here are here are the things that have plagued me the most in life and maybe maybe I did not approach them right you know it, that is such a difficult thing to say and if that's what's being said I mean that is that is bold that is commendable and um, I do not want to downplay that at all. Um, that is that is something that I'm very happy to have been able to witness. Absolutely, absolutely. I want to talk real quick about uh, one of my favorite parts of the movie has got to be the final voicemail from his grandma, you know, because it mixes together a few great things that are coming together in the movie. Um, so before the previous voicemails from his grandma – She's established as kind of annoying. I think we're meant to see it from Jack's perspective, and he just views her as an annoyance. It's like, you know, why is this woman contacting him now? What does she want? You know, why is she so kind of cavalier about everything? And then in the final voicemail, she reveals that she's dying, you know? And she wanted to reconnect with family, and she tried to reconnect with Jack, and he just brushed her off, you know? He didn't respond. And again, it's up to the viewer to kind of decide how much of that is his own fault and how much is just the stuff that's happened to him. Um... But she says she's dying, and she can't reconnect with her grandson, who she just wants to see before she passes on to whatever comes next. Um, She sends him money anyway, you know, for all the Christmases and birthdays she's mixed. And then, finally, in this, like, last bit of uh, very, very deadpan humor, which uh, made me laugh out loud unexpectedly, uh, she says, send your address to charlesanddianaforever at (laughs) gmail.com. Yeah, yeah. So that was that was another good example of another arc, like I was talking about, which is sort of the other side of this debate that it's talking about. You know, particularly about COVID, we've got we've got this woman who's clearly you know an old person. She's a member of the old guard, an old conservative, and she's got this totally ridiculous email address that reflects that. But it comes right at the end of this entire scene, which just humanizes her and establishes her situation as so tragic and sympathetic. It's one of it's one of those moments with the movie just at its absolute finest. It's something that really really stuck out to me. I love that scene. Yeah, I mean, what in the world is better than a satisfying climax or conclusion? And um, this this movie certainly has that. Not just uh, narratively, you know, following a structure of you know what's what's in the briefcase. I'm wondering all along, and we have an answer. But also, you know, thematically. Um, what is what is all being said here? What is kind of the capstone of this character's arc? Um, all, all of these things are coming together in in one in a span of you know less than five minutes, and mm-hmm. it was it was tragic and triumphant, and it was um, uh, revelatory, and it's just so many things, and. Um, it was it was very fulfilling, if not cathartic. Um, it was just it was amazing to see a a very important story that is often told poorly, told uniquely and well, be concluded in such a you know staccato, as I was saying before. You know that's that's a, a moment. From the movie that I'll that I'll remember as long as I remember this movie, and um, I think it just it just perfectly uh, encapsulates everything that is trying to be said. You know that w- what is the biggest problem? What transcends all other problems? The disconnect in the world. You know, um, and it was just mm-hmm. it was very cool to see. That's something that weighs heavily on my mind. And uh, I found more heavily than I gave it credit for. It's something that 
I now am longing to see other filmmakers do. Um, Brett did it first. I'm, I'm excited to see uh, more movies like this because I have not yet. Totally. I think this is the first movie I've run across that has actually handled COVID well instead of just kind of name dropping <laughs> it to be annoying. Yep, yep. No, you're you're absolutely correct in saying that at the beginning you were worried. I was I was worried as well that this was gonna be very very woke and and COVID. But no, seriously, like yeah. this that that is a great microcosm for the film, not not overstepping and not being too ham fisted while still saying what's important. Absolutely, beautiful film, unique film, angry film, passionate film. I'm so happy that we got the chance to watch this and cover this. As am I. Well, uh, I think I personally have at least run out of uh, good things to say about nobody loves you and you don't deserve to exist. Folks, I mean, hopefully you didn't listen to the spoiler section. If you did somehow and you haven't watched the movie, please watch the movie. Jack, thank you again for reaching out to us. This is a movie that, I'm going to be honest, neither of us would probably have heard of if you hadn't reached out, but I'm so, so happy that I got the chance to experience this. Uh, I wish you and your team all the best. Uh, thank you all for listening. You can reach out to us through socials. Uh, if you're interested in giving feedback, ideas for new episodes, you know, thoughts, criticisms, uh, etc. Uh, you can reach out to us at armchair critics podcast at gmail.com uh, on Instagram at armchair critics podcast on Twitter at critics armchair, any of those platforms. Uh, thank you so much for listening. And uh, we hope you join us next episode, which as we said, will is a little up in the air. will most likely be sometime in the summer. We got a few exciting ideas for episodes lined up, so we hope you stick with us uh, through those. Thank you all.